Music for Christmas with BBC One. A seasonal suggestion from Rolf Harris. Give us a kiss for Christmas. Under the mistletoe. Nationwide's carol competition. Val Dunican celebrates in traditional style. The hit sounds of 1980. Spinner's special brand of warmth. Over the hills and everywhere, go tell it on the mountain. Jesus Christ is born. Everywhere, go tell it on the mountain. Music for everyone at Christmas with BBC One. The first part of James Last's 1978 concert in London is being shown on BBC Two shortly. And in 25 minutes here on BBC One, Play for Today is a tragic comedy about a man who decides to go mad. Now at nine o'clock, the news on BBC One with Richard Baker. Mr Heseltine cuts government help to local councils but says rate rises should be lower than this year's. An Irishman facing bomb charges tunnels his way out of Brixton prison. General Alexander Haig is named as America's next Secretary of State. And tens of thousands of Polish workers remember their comrades who died in the shipyard riots of ten years ago. Good evening. The local authorities of England and Wales have been told you're to get less money from the government next year and you must squeeze your spending further. The result? Rates will go up, though the Environment Secretary, Mr Heseltine, says the increases should be lower than they were this year. His critics disagree, and there are forecasts of rises in some places of even 100%. Mr Heseltine has done two things. He's cut the rate support grants by 1%, and he's changing the way the government's money will be distributed. Big cities will get less, London will suffer most. But Mr Heseltine says the system is fair and rational. It's not seen that way by the shadow environment spokesman, Mr Kaufman, who believes today is a black day for local authorities. He says Mr Heseltine's plan is a recipe for social injustice and urban decay. Francis Coverdale looks at this latest development in the government's battle to cut public spending. The local authorities with more than two and a half million employees account for a quarter of our public spending. In Mr Heseltine's words, their financial decisions are an integral part of the national economy and the rate support grant must reflect this. The 1% cut brings the government's contribution to the councils down to £9,027 million. And it's not only the percentage that's being cut. Local authorities have been told to reduce their spending next year by £500 million. So it's a smaller percentage of a smaller amount. In making their calculations, the Treasury assumed that pay increases will be kept at 6% and that prices won't rise above 11%. If that's the case, and if the local authorities meet the proposed cuts in spending, Mr Heseltine says rate increases should be much lower than they were this year. But that's not how some of the local authorities see it, especially those in London, where there are already warnings of increases of 50, 60, 70 percent and higher. Those figures were put to Mr Heseltine after his Commons announcement. I want to understand, and every one of us is involved in this, if those rate increases are the sort of magnitude that you're mentioning, for which, at rate payer level, there can be no justification, are going to take place, we shall see more bankruptcies, more unemployment. What we've asked local government to do is to reduce by 3% the volume of its expenditure. Now, if they compare that 3% with what is happening in the private sector, where companies, under the weight of interest charges, rate levels, tax levels, are simply not being able to keep anything like that scale of activity, they've got to realize that they are involved in the battle against inflation, and they have got to take every step to ensure that rate increases are far, far less than that, and our settlement enables that to happen. As well as cutting the grant, Mr Heseltine's also introduced a new system of allocating it. Under the old one, the grant was based on the amount local authorities had spent in the past, so the big spenders got more money. The new block grant system is worked out on what Whitehall calculates the councils should be spending. Those calculations favour the Shire counties and hit the cities particularly hard. For most inner London boroughs, the lost grant is equivalent to a rate increase of 10%.
For Manchester, it's 6.2%, for Leeds, 6.5%, and for Newcastle, 5.7%. Mr Hesseltine says the new system is fairer and an incentive not to overspend, but the opposition spokesman, Gerald Kaufman, accused Mr Hesseltine of appointing himself the Commissar of Local Government. The chairman of the association representing the big city authorities was equally critical. Grant should go where the need is. And I say, how can the Secretary of State sit in the DOV and tell each local authority how much it should spend, how much its rates should be levied, when it doesn't know the needs in each authority, because needs vary from one authority to another. Now, you've made forecasts that rates might have to go up 50, 60 percent. Do you still hold to that after this announcement? I'm sure that we're talking about a minimum increase of 50 percent in the London areas. For those councils which do overspend and increase their rates by that sort of amount, Mr Hesseltine has a further deterrent. He'll penalise them in following years by cutting their rate support grants still further. Earlier this year, Mr Hesseltine named 14 local authorities as bad overspenders. One was Newcastle upon Tyne. From there, to the Tim attack Baker on reports. big spending local authorities is aimed directly at places like Newcastle. The city spends well over a hundred million pounds a year, five times more than it did ten years ago. Ratepayers seem certain to face another big rise next year, an increase that could only be offset by more spending cuts. Anticipating today's announcement, chief officers of the council have drawn up this secret list of options for reducing services and manpower. But Labour councillors are unlikely to agree lightly to a document which envisages cutbacks totalling £6 million and the loss of up to a 1,000 jobs. Today's news can only mean either very significantly increased rates or very substantial cuts in services or some combination of the two. And that must mean, I'm afraid, uh, further depression and recession for the city. I'm afraid a significant rate increase is inescapable. We have to weigh the consequences of that against the consequences for people who depend on services. Newcastle has decided it could save three million pounds in city schools by cutting equipment and grants and losing 200 teaching posts. But it's likely to shy away from such contingencies and opt instead for a rates rise of 40% or more. Not so in Cumbria. Rates here have gone up 20% for the last three years running. And the council says enough is enough. Householders will benefit from the government's help to rural areas, and Cumbria is keen to respond by keeping its spending down. Country schools have already closed. 71 teaching jobs have been lost this year, classroom equipment's in short supply. Rate increases next year will probably be kept to a minimum, but many of Cumbria's 20,000 employees could pay for that with their jobs. Tony Baker reporting. Tonight, the government announced further cuts in spending on education. Next year, almost £140 million more will go from the budget, on top of savings of £200 million already announced. Teachers' leaders say it will mean a further decline in standards, and the Education Secretary, Mr Carlyle, today admitted that the cuts would have some impact on standards, but he said it's what the nation can afford. The leader of the Roman Catholic Church in Ireland, Cardinal O'Fee, has appealed to Mrs Thatcher to intervene personally in the May's hunger strike. He said someone must take the initiative immediately to avert a tragedy. But the Prime Minister earlier ruled out any concessions. This afternoon she told MPs in the Commons there is no question, now or at all, of giving these hunger strikers political status. Seven more Republican prisoners joined the hunger strike at the May's today. There are now 37 Republicans refusing to take food, as well as three women supporters at Armagh Jail. Six loyalists at the Mays are also fasting. A police manhunt is continuing for three men, one an IRA suspect, who escaped from the high security wing of Brixton Prison before dawn. All sea and airports were put on alert soon after the men tunnelled out of their cells. The Home Office has ordered an immediate inquiry. The Irishman, 25-year-old Gerard Tewitt, faces charges arising out of the Christmas bombing campaign in London two years ago. He was described by a bomb squad officer today as highly dangerous. Tewitt got away with two other prisoners, Stanley Christopher Thompson and James Moody. A report on the escape by Roger Currell. The escape was discovered at five o'clock this morning, three hours after the men were last seen by prison officers. The men were being held in adjoining cells in a special security wing. 
The two other men tunneled through their walls to join up with Chewitt, whose cell was at the edge of the wing. Then all three broke through the exterior wall, climbed over a roof and dropped into a yard where they found a store of building materials. To climb over the prison's 15-foot high perimeter wall, they used scaffolding poles taken from the store. So how long do the police think it would have taken them to plan their escape? It's very difficult to say, and in fact I couldn't speculate, but it's not a, a five-minute job. It must have taken them some considerable time, but whether that would be days or weeks, I couldn't say. Do you find it a matter of some surprise that they, they weren't detected? Well, certainly uh, we're very disappointed that uh, Tuart in, in particular has got away. He's the one that uh, we in the anti-terrorist branch are particularly interested in. The breakout has heightened concern over security at Brixton. Recently, it was revealed that some men had been getting in and out at weekends to visit pubs and clubs. They'd been tying together prison clothing to get over the wall. Then there's the prison officer's dispute, although the Home Office say security hasn't been affected by that. As a result of today's escape, security is being tightened inside Brixton, and the Home Secretary has appointed the Deputy Director General of the Prison Service, Mr Gordon Fowler, to carry out an inquiry. One of the other prisoners in the escape, Stanley Christopher Thompson, was cleared of criminal charges against him at St Albans Crown Court this afternoon. The jury was told he'd escaped before they returned their verdict. Thompson had been in custody at Brixton on charges of armed robbery. Tonight, his solicitor appealed to Thompson to give himself up. Five prisoners who spent the night on the roof of Risley Remand Centre ended their demonstration late this afternoon. They were the last of about 50 inmates at Risley who started the protest last night because they were prevented from watching a Western on television. The prisoners, all under 21, broke their way into the loft and clambered onto the roof where they spent the night in near freezing conditions. Most gave themselves up early this morning, but the five remained throughout the day. There was some damage to furniture and bedding, and about 100 prisoners will have to be moved to other jails. After the death of Barry Prosser, a prisoner at Winston Green Prison in Birmingham, a senior prison officer, Melvin Al Alfred Jackson, has been charged with his murder. Mr Prosser was found dead in his hospital wing cell last August. Foreign news now. Retired General Alexander Haig is, as expected, to be America's Secretary of State in the new Reagan administration. The job is roughly equivalent to Foreign Secretary in this country, and Haig's appointment has already caused some controversy in Washington, as our correspondent Martin Bell now reports. He has served a Republican White House before, both in and out of uniform, as he switched with remarkable ease from soldier to civilian and back again. In four years, Alexander Haig rose from the rank of Colonel, an advisor to Henry Kissinger, who's still his patron, to four-star general. And then, in the final days of Watergate, he was made White House Chief of Staff. Democratic Party criticisms of him center on this phase, whether in President Nixon's service he was implicated in the cover-up, or whether, as his defenders insist, he helped to save the presidency. He held this government together at a very crucial time in our fairly recent history. And I think he's a fine gentleman. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with being ambitious. Most human beings are. But uh, the bottom line is that he served this country well. General Haig returned to uniform to be commander of NATO forces in Europe, a post that by all accounts he held with distinction. He retired last year, apparently harboring presidential ambitions, but lacking the popular support he needed to launch a political career. That didn't stop him talking politics, as at the Senate hearing on the Arms Limitation Treaty with the Soviet Union. Our American president was always reassured by a backdrop of strategic superiority vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. And I would dread the consequences of a balance between ourselves and the Soviet Union where, for the first time since the development of nuclear weapons, the United States is second and inferior. But Democrats were as critical of this performance as they were suspicious of Haig's role in the Nixon White House. And an enemy it's useful not to have is the senior Democrat in the Senate, Robert Byrd of West Virginia. And I was less than impressed by his testimony there, and uh, that will be a factor in my own decision. I personally don't think I could vote for him.
The harmony between Democrats and Republicans that marked Ronald Reagan's last visit to Capitol Hill is unlikely to survive the confirmation hearings for Secretary of State. But it's a sign of how badly Mr. Reagan wants Alexander Haig that he's willing to go into a partisan fight to get him. This is Martin Bell in Washington. One issue facing Mr. Reagan could be decided even before he takes office next month. The government of Iran has now said it officially. The 52 hostages can go home any time. Ayatollah Khomeini is waiting for America to meet only one condition, freeing millions of dollars worth of frozen Iranian assets. Today, his government made it clear. The hostages have become a hindrance and a waste of time. And in the words of Prime Minister Muhammad Ali Rajai, it's up to America to pick any time or day and take away the spies. So after a year and a month, they could be home for Christmas. Iran's message is being sent to America via Algeria, the country that's acting as intermediary. And there'll be no official response until that message is received. Iran and the 12 other nations of OPEC have put up the price of the oil they produce. That'll probably mean up to sixpence more on a gallon of petrol in the new year. It'll also put up prices in the shops because haulage costs will go up as well. The OPEC meeting ended on the Indonesian island of Bali with agreement on roughly an overall 10% rise in oil prices. From there, our economics correspondent Mark Rogerson now reports. What OPEC has come up with is a formula which virtually allows each member to charge what it likes for its crude oil. If they behave as they're expected to, and as Sheikh Yamani would like and hope, then it'll mean an increase of about 10% in oil prices in the new year, say five to six pence on a gallon in Britain. Not a big rise, but it comes as the cost-cutting war on the garage forecourts is ending, and it's only the first instalment for next year. But the conference ended with an extraordinary demonstration by the Iranians. After offering to exchange themselves for their oil minister, captured by the Iraqis, they exhibited a number of gruesome photographs of the effects of the Gulf War, all very far from the price of oil. For the Western nations as a whole, the users of oil rather than the producers of oil, this meeting probably means about 10% on their oil import bill. And that in the first half of the year is as much as, for example, the British government were expecting for the whole of 1981. Where things go from there depends as much as anything else on the fortunes of the Iran-Iraq war. If that war drags on, the five pence or so that the British motorist will probably pay extra when these price increases feed through looks like being just the first instalment. This is Mark Rogerson in Bali. British Aerospace have won a £200 million order for their Rapier anti-aircraft missile against all other competition. The Swiss government tested every similar system before ordering the Rapier, which is already in use with the British Army. The Swiss chose the British-made Rapier only after 12 years of detailed examination of this and other rival systems produced by France, Germany and the United States. As an anti-aircraft weapon, Rapier is both lightweight and highly mobile. The Swiss say they need the system to defend their armoured units from possible air attack. Rapier is both fast and accurate. In six seconds, the system locks onto its target. It can engage and destroy anything from a helicopter to a low-flying aircraft, manoeuvring at supersonic speed. The £200 million contract will involve part of the system being built in Switzerland and part in Britain, and there could be more big orders for Rapier on the way. The Polish city of Gdansk tonight became the focal point for the biggest show of unity the country's seen in years. Hundreds of thousands of people, politicians, priests and new trade unionists among them, congregated around a monument commemorating riots there ten years ago. It was for Poland unprecedented the first official observance of those killed in the riots. And it was for the unions a momentous day. Our correspondent Tim Sebastian reports. The three steel crosses outside the Lenin shipyard built to commemorate the first three workers who died. Ten years later, there are still doubts about the final death toll. The flags symbolize a nation trying to heal its divisions the state, the church and the workers. Without the strikes at the shipyard this summer, there would have been no official ceremony and no monument. 
In the event, it was one of the main conditions of the Gdansk agreements which ended the strikes. Many people say it will remove some of the bitterness from their memories of 10 years ago. The authorities, they feel, have learned their lesson. Like most big ceremonies in Poland, this was primarily a religious occasion, one of the few attended by state leaders. A leading actor read out the names of the dead while their families waited in the crowd. Each name was followed by shouts of, they are with us. And then a minute of silence to try to bridge the long 10 year gap the time when the state tried to forget the riots and the workers refused. Appropriately, it was the union leader Lech Wałęsa who spoke first. He said the monument wasn't only a reminder of the dead, it was a warning to those who govern and a symbol of hope to the people. It proved too that no conflict should be solved by force. Wałęsa, unknown just six months ago, now has the full support of the Catholic Church. Its backing means respectability and power. Above all, this was a ceremony aimed at uniting the country after months, even years of division. The three wreaths came from the state, from the victims' families, and from the Solidarity Union. These crosses are a sharp reminder that this ceremony would be unthinkable elsewhere in the Soviet bloc. Tonight's report from Tim Sebastian in Gdansk. On its first day in power, the new Ugandan government of Dr. Milton Obote has received diplomatic recognition from the British Foreign Office. Dr. Obote has been naming his cabinet, and despite accusations against his party of violence and corruption during the elections, he's called on the new opposition to end the political rivalry that's threatening to split the country again. Brian Barron was at the ceremony when Dr. Obote was sworn in. All this was supposed to happen 48 hours ago, but Dr. Abate postponed it to enable a high-powered Tanzanian delegation to be here. Because quite simply, if the Tanzanian army hadn't chased Idi Amin away 20 months ago, Dr. Abate wouldn't be here today. So everything's owed to General Musuguri, who since the war has become commander of Tanzania's army. 